Hey, good morning, Christ Church. What a beautiful Sunday morning, and it's so good to see you. I heard there was a Browns game last week, but I, yeah, I, yeah that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure we're, we're all, yeah, we're, we're all on the same page here, um, but it's so good to see you today. Let me pray for us, and we'll get to the message. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this time together. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the book of Galatians and the powerful truths that it has for us today. I pray, Lord, you could open our hearts, our minds, our spirits to it. I pray, Lord, that as we just look at this as a church family, that you could center us on the gospel, and we could be strengthened, be renewed, be refocused on the glory and the goodness of Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray it would be transforming in our lives. So help us, Lord. Bless us. Bless us in this new season of life with back to school and sports and everything that's going on. And help us to keep you at the center of it all. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, several years ago, me and my, my good buddy, we went on this, this hike. And we were hiking on some, like, you know, pretty big cliffs. Like, they were probably several hundred feet tall. And we were just kind of having fun and having a little bit of adventure. And as we were going through this hike, uh, my buddy slipped. And if you've ever, you know, kind of lost your footing on like a, a pretty steep cliff, it's really hard to stop yourself. You know, just the, the momentum takes over. And so I was, I was a little bit away from him, a little bit above him. So I saw all this happen. I saw him slip. I saw him start to slide. I saw that he couldn't really like, you know, stop himself. And he was not that far from just a sheer drop. And so I was like, this is really bad. You know, and this is all happening like in a couple seconds. And, uh, and there was nothing I could do. I was, you know, too far away, just nothing. And as he's getting close to the edge, all of a sudden he reached out his hand and he grabbed this small tree and it stopped him. It was like right out of a movie. Just like his hand just went out and stopped him and saved him from falling off the cliff. And when I kind of ran down to him, I was like, dude, that was insane. I was preparing a speech I was going to tell your wife after this. Like, I, this was bad. Um, and, and just your grip on that tree <laughs> saved you. Um, and it was, it was kind of uh, an amazing thing. And when we've been, uh, we started looking at the book of Galatians, and the book of Galatians is about holding on to the gospel. It's about strengthening our grip on the message of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, and what that means and what that does in our life. And what we saw last week was, was Paul, the author of this book, he was writing to this ancient region of churches. And he was saying, you're losing your grip on the gospel. Because I don't know why, if you hold on to something for a long time, you know, your, your grip can start to wear out. And Paul said your, your spiritual grip is wearing out. And if you lose grip of this, you're going off the cliff. Might sound a bit dramatic, but Paul's language here is super intense. He's saying if, if you lose your grip on the gospel, you lose all spiritual vitality and all spiritual health and all spiritual growth in your life. And so this book is about, is about strengthening our grip on that. So last week we looked at chapter 1, and today we're going to look at chapter 2. And I'm going to pick up at the last uh, section of verses of chapter 2, but I want to explain the whole chapter to you. But here's where we're going to begin today. Verse 16. Paul says this, Yet we know a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. 
For through the law, I died to the law, so I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live, in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't nullify or reject the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. You got all that? <laughs> There's a lot in there, isn't there? And if you're like, kind of like, what is Paul saying? That's okay, we're going to talk through this. Uh, but there, there are some tremendous ideas in this. And, and these are all about, it's all about keeping our grip on the gospel. That if you're a follower of Jesus today, one of the challenges of our spiritual lives is keeping the main thing the main thing. Is keeping centered on what matters most and, and how we connect to God. And so this whole group of verses that we just read, they're, they're set up in chapter 2 by this really interesting story and problem. And I want to talk to you about this for a moment. And if you were to read the whole of chapter 2, you would see that it, it begins with this story about Paul. And Paul is the one who wrote this. He is the one who said, I've received this message of the gospel from God himself, and I'm here to share it with the world. And he talks about this interaction that he had with Peter. Now, if Peter, if that name doesn't ring a bell, let me tell you who Peter is. Peter was one of the original disciples of Jesus. That when Jesus began his ministry, he invited Peter to follow him. And Peter was the oldest of the disciples. So he was the de facto leader, if you will. And so Peter became this, this really sort of central figure in Christianity. He was there at the beginning. And, and Paul says, I, I saw Peter doing some things I didn't think was right. This is what chapter 2 talks about. I saw Peter, and, and I saw that, that he was acting in ways that were inconsistent with the message of Christianity. And so he says, here's what I did. So he said, I confronted Peter to his face. I got in his face. Whoa. Things are getting real in the book of Galatians here. And, 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 then, and then Paul talks about this conversation that he had with Peter and why he said, hey, Peter, what you're doing, it's out of line with the truth of the gospel. You're losing your grip on the gospel. But, but even worse, it's confusing other people who are trying to connect with God. Now, here's why I'm telling you this story. And I think there's a couple things that are so important to point out about this. And, and here's the first thing that I think is just worth thinking about for a second. Have you ever heard people say things about the Bible and they're like, you know what? The Bible is just made up by man. The Bible is just kind of, it's, it's something people made up because religion is a powerful way to control people. Have you ever, ever heard something like that? And, and there's a lot of arguments. There, there's a lot of uh, talk about that. And people say, you know, yes, or, or maybe kind of the, the Bible's kind of like mythology, like we have other types of mythology in the world. And, and many times people will make arguments about the credibility of the Bible along those lines. But I want you to just think about this for a second. Galatians, this book that we're looking at today, is probably the first book written in the New Testament. The, the first, so this is, this is the very first one. And in the very first book written of the New Testament, Peter and Paul are fighting. Now, parents, are you supposed to fight in front of your kids? I know it happens, but you're not supposed to, right? But you're like, but I just, I have to make that last point. I know I shouldn't do this. I get it. I get it. I know what that, that's like. But, but you, you want to be a united front, right? You don't want to confuse the kids. You don't want to, uh, you know, give them that insecurity of, of, of fighting in front of them and that sort of thing. But, but here, Paul and Peter are fighting in front of the kids. Now, here's why I'm saying all of this. If you were making this story up, you, you would smooth that out. 
You with me? If you were making this story up and you were trying to show the credibility of Christianity, you'd be like, Peter and Paul, they, they believed and agreed on everything. They never, they were so filled with God. They were so, that there was never, but, but here's why it's there. And I don't want you to miss this. is because the Bible is about real people in real life. That this is, this, it's not sugarcoating it. It's not smoothing it out. That, that Peter and Paul, guess what? They were like you and me. They were knuckleheads sometimes. They made mistakes. They, they, were, they were as in need of God as you and I are today. They were as dependent of God as you and I are today. And I think that this story right here actually shows us something really powerful about the credibility of scriptures. Now, here's the second thing. It also shows that that Christianity is ultimately, it's not about any person, but it's about God. Now, again, here's Peter. Peter is like, he's as high up on the food chain as you can get. He hung out with Jesus. He was close with Jesus. He, was, um, he, he preached this first sermon when, when the church started and thousands of people were, were be saved. But, but even with all of that, he was not above correction. Because even the best of men are men at best. And the message of Christianity is not about any man. It's about God. And at the end of the day, I just want to remind you, don't allow your faith to be shaken up by the imperfections of man. Because from day one, what we're meant to do is look beyond the person and look at the message of Christ behind them. That the the best thing we can do for you as a church is help you to see beyond us and see God for yourself. You with me on this? And, and Christianity is, is bigger than that. Now, here's the, the third thing. This chapter also shows us that God can use conflict in really healthy ways in our life. Just raise your hand if you love conflict today. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah I'm, most of us probably don't love conflict. Amen? And, and can we, we be honest that, that many times if maybe our feelings are hurt, or if someone wounds us, or if we have needs that aren't being met, um, it can be hard to talk about that with people that we're close to in a healthy way. Amen? And, and sometimes because it's difficult, sometimes what we do is we avoid it all together. And when we do that, we can miss some of the ways that God wants to grow us. Because here's what you will see. In, through this conflict between Paul and Peter, it actually ends up helping the church. God uses it to move things forward. And the problem in our lives is not that we have conflict in our relationships. The problem is just how we deal with it. Conflict is not an inherently bad thing. And learning to navigate it well can add a lot of value to our lives. It can create clarity and depth and intimacy. You believe that today? Just give me a mediocre amen if you're with me. Okay. But here's, here's what part of the challenge is, is that probably most of us, our models for conflict came from how we grew up. And I want to I take you back there for a moment. And I want you to just look at, at your, how you grew up and think about what did it teach you about conflict? See, some of us, it, it may be like, you're like, well, here's, here's what we, I learned about conflict growing up. You don't have it, right? You just kind of, if there's problems, we don't talk about them. You know, put, that could be a lesson that many of us got. If it, hey, because it's messy and challenging, we're just going to kind of act like it's not there. But how many of us know that that doesn't actually really help anything? And that you can only do that so long before you just can't anymore. And then sometimes 
it builds and builds. Or for others of us in the room, maybe conflict was always really hurtful and wounding. So it could only be done in a very damaging way, whether that was verbal or physical or whatever. And so, so our model is we, we only saw it in a very wounding and hurtful way. And, and all of us, we probably got a lot of different lessons about it, but many of them probably are not helpful. But what I actually appreciate about this passage and this story is it shows us a bit of what it can look like in a healthy way. And let me, let me, I'll just, I'll move on from this in a minute, but let me torture you for one more minute on this subject, because this is really important. And, and have you ever noticed that the most important relationships in your life are the relationships where you will have the most conflict? And if we don't learn how to navigate it well, church, we're going to miss some of the ways that God wants to bless our life and move it forward. Because believe it or not, that, that will be an avenue. Thank God I'm getting an amen back there. Thank you, sister. <laughs> Only one. The Lord can say by many or by few. <laughs> but church, I know th th this is so important to, to grow in this ability as far as of Christ. And your most important relationships are going to have the most conflict in it, right? I, there is no one that makes my wife madder than me. <laughs> and she is a patient woman, <laughs> but I, I, I still find a way. <laughs> there, there's no one that you love more than your kids, but there's also no one that gives you more stress and conflict in your life than them. Amen? The more important the relationship, the more that's going to be there. And so we need to learn how to navigate it in healthy ways. Hey, if, if you want to have healthy community as a follower of Christ, you're going to have conflict. Church, being a healthy church, it means we're going to rub each other the wrong way sometimes. It's going to happen. Paul and Peter got into it. And they saw Jesus. I don't think you and I have saw Jesus. So guess what? <laughs> it's it's going to happen. But, but what do we do? Well, we seek to honor God and love each other through it. You with me on this? And, and there's a way to do it. Now, here's just a, the last two things I'll say about it. Here's Paul, and I, I just want you to see this, how the gospel helps him with this. Paul could have easily said, you know what? I have nothing to add to this conversation. And if you know Paul's story, you know why this might have been a very alluring thought. Because Paul was not like Peter. When Peter was hanging around Jesus, Paul had wanted nothing to do with Jesus and his followers. That the, the earliest time that we see Paul, he was not pro-Jesus. He was like, I want this movement of Jesus destroyed. And he was actively trying to do it. And so Paul doesn't have the history. He doesn't have the experiences that Peter has. He's, he's the new kid on the block. And he's got this baggage of the past. But, but yet, but here's what the gospel does to our lives. That in Christ, there's no one better than you, and there's no one worse than you. That in Christ, your voice, every one of our voice matters. As a, you know, in, in, in life, we might try to make these false hierarchies, and, and we think this person is better than us for this, and this person is better. But do you know what the gospel does? It says, no, we're all sinners saved by grace. And your voice matters. And your needs matter. And it's a healthy thing to talk about it. And so it gave Paul the grounding to have the conversation. Now, when Paul brought this up to Peter, here's what Peter did. And this, this might be the most amazing part of this whole chapter. Here's what Peter did. Peter listened. Did you hear that? <laughs> He listened, and he changed. 
And you know what? And how easy, how easy would it be for Peter to say, Paul, who do you think you are? Tell me what's up here. What, what do you know? I was at the cross. Sure, I denied Jesus, but I was still there. <laughs> Let's, you know, he could kind of edit out some of those details. Uh, I, where, you know, he, he, could, he could sort of, he could uh, impose his authority, but do you know what he does? He actually receives it. And the church, the kingdom of God, is healthier. And so here's what the gospel does. It, it means that, that all of us need a humility to realize, man, sometimes God's going to bring good people that might have stuff we don't want to hear, but it will be good for us to hear and to change. Church, I want to tell you something that might blow your mind. Your spouse might have right ideas about what you could do different. <laughs> I'm sorry. They, they, it, you, it might do your soul some good to listen to them and say, yeah, no, they're not right about this. They're not right about that. No, the gospel helps us to be humble. It says, man, we, we all are broken. We all have blind spots. We, we all need each other to grow to be everything God wants us to be, but we have to listen to each other. Now, that doesn't mean you have to listen to everything that someone throws your way, but people who know you and love you, church, we got to have an open heart. Amen? And, and so, so Peter seems to have that. All right, now, let's move on from there. And so then we, then we get to these verses today, and, and these verses then go in to how the message of Christ is, is at work in our lives. And Paul talks about this idea of justification. And justification is part of the central ideas of really understanding the message of Christ. I like how Tim Keller says it. He says it this way, we're not acceptable to God because we actually become righteous. We become actually righteous because we are acceptable to God. Here's what justification means. It's a change of view of something. It's not necessarily that that something changes, but how it's viewed is changed. Let me, let me give you an example of this. If you saw someone just out at the mall or something, just go and tackle someone, you might view that and you might say, wow, that was a really mean thing to do. Like, that, that was really terrible. And, and if you just saw it and you saw them tackle someone, you might say, that's not a good thing. But then if you learned that maybe they had a weapon and they were going to hurt someone, you would then view that same incident and you'd say, well, that was a heroic action. You with me on this? The, what happened didn't change, but the view of it changed. And here's what justification means. It means that God's view of us changes. That God's view of us he looks at us, not that we've changed and done all these great and different things, but what the message of the gospel means is that through Christ, God's view of us changes. And he looks on us with love and favor and acceptance and grace. Now, in these beginning verses, Paul says, but I want you to know God's view of us changes not because of works, not because of the law, not because of the changes we make in our life, but it changes through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, now this is super important. If we were to ask many people today, and we said, what does it mean to be a Christian? Many people might say, well, it means to be a good person. And you say, all right, well, what, what does it mean to be a good person? They might say something like, well, you know, you treat people the way you want to be treated and, you know, try to, for the most part, be nice and, you know, try to do sort of more good than bad. And if you, if you do that, it'll change God's view of you. And what Paul says, is Paul says, that's not how it works at all. That's not how it works. He says, God's view of us changes because of what Jesus Christ has done, not because of what we do. You see the difference? 
At the center of Christianity is Christ. It's not us. And Paul says it's so incredibly important that we know that and that we relate to God from that place and that we never forget it. Uh, Allie and I watched this, this movie recently. It's an older movie. It's called That Thing You Do. Anybody seen that? It's, it's a great, like, I don't know, 90s romantic comedy. Um, you watch it in place of the Browns game today. You'll be happier. <laughs> That's uh, um, And you can throw it back up. And, and that thing you do, so here, here's the story of it. It's a, it's a one-hit wonder band. And they're like this, you know, kind of, high school band, and they make this great song, and they get, you know, a lot of traction, and then they start getting invited to do these bigger and bigger shows, and then eventually they get a contract with Playtone Records, which is like a, a big deal, and they climb up the charts of Playtone Records, and the leader of the band is like, well, I don't want to keep playing this one-hit wonder song that we have. I want to write new songs, and I want to show the world that there's a lot more talent in here. And so he's really driven to do that. And there's a scene in the movie where they go and they meet the, the leader, the executive of Playtone Records. And the leader of the band goes up to him, and he's like, hey, sir, we've got this great song. It's climbing up the charts. I've got way more songs in me. Can you give us some studio time? Can you help us out? And he thinks... Because of the success they've had, that he has earned a hearing and an opportunity. But the executive looks at him and he says, get out of my face. Who do you think you are? And he looks at him and he says, you haven't earned anything. You, you, you don't have any rights here. And when you and I, what has earned our right to be heard and loved by God. And Paul says, if you think it's anything you've done or you're doing, you're losing grip of the gospel. If it's anything other than the name of Jesus Christ, when you go and you stand before the Lord, and the Lord says, why should I accept you? The only real answer is Jesus Christ. That's not, Lord, well, look at all this great stuff I've done. Paul says, no, no, if that's how we think, we've lost grip of the gospel. And, and by, by realizing that, that Christ is the center of it, keeps our soul healthy. And then he says these real powerful things. He says that then the gospel, it begins to change us. So again, last week we, we talked about the order of the gospel. It, the order is not, I clean up my act, I get my life together, and then God loves me and helps me. But the order of the gospel is that God loves me and helps me, and then I begin to change. You see, there, there's a big difference. And Paul says that as, as the gospel is at work in our life, he says, now Christ lives in me. He says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He says, I've been, I've been crucified with Christ. And now the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, Paul says, as we receive the gospel, it then begins to change how we live our lives. And it changes in a couple ways. First, first, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. See, when, when we receive Christ, there's things in our life that begin to die. There's things in our life that, that God says, you can't carry these with you forward into your journey. And if you're a follower of Jesus today, and you want to make your life miserable— then try to keep bringing back into your life the things that Christ has made you dead to. Keep trying to bring back the attitudes and habits and actions and all that. Paul says, no, we, we've died to some things. See, today, church, many of us, you're not the same person today you were six months ago. 
You're not the same person you were a year ago. And why is that? It's because Christ is in you. And Christ is shaping you. And Christ is releasing some things out of your life and building some new things in it. The gospel, it, it changes us. And then Paul says, he says, I live, I live this present life. I live it for Christ. See, what, what Paul is saying, and don't miss this, he's saying, I want to live my life for Christ. I want to. I want to. Now, I know many of us, we grew up with a lot of religious guilt. And so our understanding is not, I want to serve God, it's I have to serve God. And those are very different. Paul says, I want to. I want to because Christ is at work in my life. He loved me and he gave himself for me. See, notice that again, that, that it begins first with Christ. Christ first loved me. Christ first gave himself for me. And now I give my life to him. Do you see the order there? Do you see the motivation there? Paul says, I'm, I'm doing this because the only correct response to Christ's love and to Christ's sacrifice is to give my life fully and completely to him. It's an honor and a privilege to serve God with our lives. And sometimes we forget that. I heard this great story about this uh, professor named Howard Hendricks. He was a professor in Texas, and he brought in this man who was 93 years old. It was one of his good friends to speak to his class. It was kind of like a young group that was going to probably be pastors and ministry workers one day, and he brought him to talk to the class. And he said, all right, sir, you're 93 years old. Give us some wisdom about your life. What, what are some things you regret? Just kind of share some of those thoughts. And the man got up before the class. He says, I'm 93, and for 84 years, I've served Jesus Christ. And he said, the only thing I regret is that I only have one life to give him. See, that, that, that's the gospel at work there, church. That, that, that's, that's what it does. It, it, it changes us. It changes our how we relate to God. We're drawn to him. We're not pushed to him. We're pulled to him. When, 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 it, when it's at work in my heart, it all looks different. But church, it's easy to lose our grip on it. It's easy to lose sight of it. It's easy to, to let it leak out of our lives. And so today, I just want to invite you to just continue to receive God's grace today. Paul ends these verses and he says, I don't reject the grace of God. The translation we looked at was the word nullify, but that just means the word reject. I don't use nullify a lot in my life, but it's, it's the word reject. I don't reject the grace of God, but, but I'm receiving it. I'm trusting in Christ. I'm allowing him to change and to shape my heart. So I want you to think today, and I want to think today, where do we need to receive it today? Maybe in some of our relationships, we need to receive God's grace and we need to relate to people. Maybe have some healthy conflict. Go home and get in a fight. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but maybe talk about some things that are important, but do it with a heart that's being shaped by Christ, not a heart that's being shaped by anger. Do it with a heart that seeks to love the person and not just be right. Or maybe there's some people we just, we need to listen to in our lives and say, you know what, I need to humble myself a little bit. And I need to see this as a method of God's growth in my life. For some of us, maybe we need just to, to receive in a fresh way the grace of Christ. We, we've been trying to, to change God's view of us by what we do. And we need to just remember it's what Christ has done. And maybe there's some things that God is saying, hey, son, daughter, you died to that. 
Why are you trying to bring it back? Son, daughter, your future is not in the graveyard. It's in a better place. Trust me. Follow me. And we need to receive the grace of God. Let's pray. Father, we love you. I thank you, Lord, for the gospel of grace. I pray, Lord, that, that it really will shape us. Father, where maybe we've, we've lost our grip or we've never had a real grip on it, I pray you could give that to us today. I pray, Father, wherever grace might be leaking out of our relationships, leaking out of our own heart, leaking out of our life, Lord, I pray you could just fill us today, God. We, we come to you and we want to receive from you. Thank you, Lord, for your generosity, for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. We trust in you and in you alone. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.